Hello and welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. At this time of year, millions of us resolve to get into better shape, exercise more, eat well, even attempt a dry January, having overindulged in the holidays. But by February, let's face it, we've slipped back into our old ways. For performance expert Ruben Tabares, who trains world champions, sports stars and celebrities, health and well-being is a way of life. Ruben was on course to become a top athlete himself after spending eight years at the Royal Ballet School when he was struck by a mystery illness at the age of 18. And when nothing else worked, he was left with no choice but to find a way of healing his body himself. Boxers including David Hay, George Groves and Amir Khan, footballers like John Terry and Callum Hudson-Odoi, and celebrities including P. Diddy, Naomi Watts, Tiny Temper, Dynamo and Hollywood star Jeremy Piven are among Ruben's clients and have benefited from his knowledge, wisdom and unique approach to health. And I know firsthand what it's like to train with him. So it's with great pleasure I introduce you to this week's guest, Ruben Tabares. Ruben, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Helen. And Happy New Year. Thank you. And Happy New Year to you too. You've promised me lots of exciting things this year. So I'm sure 2021 Absolutely. is going to be a good one. Now, I will never forget the first time that you and I met. It was at a boxing gym in East London. You just finished a session with Tiny Temper and we sat cross-legged and barefooted on a mat and I was absolutely blown away by your story. So I thought that might be a really good place to start. Can you share it with us? Yes, we were. Yeah, basically, I was a very, very good athlete, junior athlete. I was European junior champion. Like you said, I'd been to the Royal Ballet School. So my background was in dance and athletics. And I played a little bit of football, rugby at school. You know, I was very, very active. And then when I came back from the European junior championships, I thought I had a flu. And to cut a long story short, the flu ended up lasting for two and a half years. So for two and a half years, I had this feeling of not feeling well, waking up, my joints were aching, temperatures, etc., etc. If that had been today, I would have thought that I had COVID for two and a half years. So luckily, after going all around the world, going from doctor to doctor, and I even tried a hypnotherapist once who kept saying, and you're under, and I kept saying, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so uh, after trying everything I possibly could, I found a doctor in Dorset and he helped me recover really, really quickly. It took about three and a half months of taking Chinese medicine, homeopathy and some other things that we were doing that put me on the road to recovery. And did you ever get to the bottom of what actually was wrong? Yeah, so I had reacted adversely to one too many vaccinations all within a very close space of time. I'd, I'd been given too many. I also had seven different viruses running around in my system, creating chaos with my immune system. So it was understanding as much as I could at the time about viruses and why I was ill, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that helped me become the person that I am today. So like I said, it took three and a half months to get better. I got a little bit worse first, when I started taking all the Chinese medicine, and homeopathy and vitamin C and started drinking more water and all of these things that I started to understand would make my body first detoxify and then perform at peak levels. It took me back first before I got better. Gosh, it must have felt amazing to feel normal again, you know, particularly through your teen years, being so fit at the Royal Ballet yeah. School and, and with athletics. Was it that experience, Ruben, that really piqued your interest in, in the body and how it works and led you down the path of becoming a performance expert? Yeah, I think so. But I think I also have always had a, a keen interest in science. I took biology and chemistry A level. So even before I got ill, I was already you know, fascinated by the body, how it works. But going through that experience absolutely made me more determined to learn more. And I'm very happy that I went through that experience. A lot of people say, oh my God, it must have been hell, etc. And it was at the time. But looking back on it now, it was a blessing. Why do you say it was a blessing? Because, I mean, you do work with world-class athletes. Is, is there ever that moment where you think, oh, gosh, that, that could have been me. I was so close to that myself. I've closed the chapter on my athletics career. I tried everything at the time. I tried everything I could from going to learn from Ed Moses, who was one of the greatest Olympians of all time in America. Dan Path, who's an incredible coach. I also found an incredible strength and conditioning coach, physiotherapist. His name is Peter Marcosiano. And we work together today and we're the best of friends. And if I hadn't 
have gone through that journey. I wouldn't have found Pete and all of these people that I've learned from when I was training David Hay, for example, in Miami. I asked him if it was okay for me to go and spend some time with Angelo Dundee, who was Muhammad Ali's coach. And he was showing me everything he was doing with Muhammad Ali. And he said, maybe it'll help you get David to another level. So I'm going to share my knowledge with you. So I've been very, very lucky. I've had a very inquisitive mind from a young man. I've always wanted to know as much as I possibly could. So that's why I say it's a blessing in disguise, because having to seek the truth and seek answers led me down that path. And I've been able to work with many, many different athletes across many different sports, not just boxing and football, but also athletics. I was coaching Dean Asher Smith, who became world champion, broke the British record for 100 and 200 meters, worked with international rugby players, etc, etc. So I'm blessed. And tell us about the approach that you take when you're working with professional athletes, because it's a whole approach, isn't it? It's not just about the training or just about the nutrition. Give us a flavour of what you bring to the table, if you like. It's not just training or nutrition. And whether it's an athlete or a business person or... Uh, or a mere mortal like me. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not a mere mortal, but no matter who the person is, we all want to achieve peak performance. We always start with a consultation to try and get to know the person and find out as much as we can about them, what they're able to implement, how much time they've got, because there's no point in trying to do things as perfectly as possible if you don't have the time, if you're at work all day. So it's about finding small ways to implement as much as possible throughout the day that eventually make a huge difference. It's the little things that make a huge difference. So we start with detoxification, but not detoxification by just having green juices and not eating. We have found that the body responds much better to cleaning up the diet gradually and adding things. So at the beginning, when we first start working with someone, we actually make them eat more food. Then the body very cleverly picks food that's got the most nutrition and you start gravitating towards that. So there's all these little techniques that we found over the course of decades that work and they work for everybody and they create performance, whether you're trying to become heavyweight champion of the world or you're trying to perform in, in a business scenario. Tell us about how you got involved with boxing in particular, because we mentioned some names in the intro there and there are many more. I talked about David Hay, George Groves, Amir Khan. You love your boxing mm -hmm. and that's a big part of your work. How did you get into that side of things? Well, before I got into boxing, I had a, an athletics manager and she basically said to me, my brother is a boxer. And as it turned out, he was a very, very good boxer who's a middleweight. And he was one of the best boxers in the world back in the 70s and 80s, I believe. And so she got in touch with him and he said, yeah, I'd love for Ruben to come and train with us. So off I went to New York. I spent six months in New York living in the most terrible hotel. It wasn't even a hotel. It was one of those motel things. We have uh, a neon light outside. Yeah, I shared, a, I shared a room with a very, very large rat every evening. <laughs> I was there six months, living like a boxer, training twice a day with the boxers, and then on top of that, doing my own athletics training. And uh, the guy's name was Michael Olajide Jr. And he's an incredible guy. He is very, very successful in his own right. And he started to teach me all of the things that he used to do. Then when I was here and I met Peter Marcosiano, Pete actually discovered David when he was 16 years old. Pete and another guy called Adam Booth were looking after David. So David Hay. David Hay, yes. And Pete, because of other commitments, couldn't really look after David. So he said to Adam, look, I think Ruben should come in and train David. He's very knowledgeable and see how it works out. And it worked out well because I helped him become heavyweight champion of the world. And what's David like to work with? Amazing. He's a very, very focused individual. The whole time I was working with him, maybe it was because... I was an athlete still. So I was an athlete training an athlete. It became very competitive. So we would try and beat each other at if it was sprints or the Versa climber or circuits or strength work. We were always competing. So that pushed David to another level and pushed me to another level. So it was constant, you know. So I think that also helps because I also train with the people that I train. And you were like brothers, really, the pair of you now, aren't you? There's a very close relationship between you. Yes, there is a very close relationship between us and we're very good friends. We've just recently embarked on a wellness business 
coming to fruition sometime this year. Ah, sounds like that's <coughs> top secret at the moment. So I won't, I won't push you further <laughs> at, at the minute. But when you look back at the, the boxing events you've been at, mm. what are the proudest moments for you when you've been ringside? Proudest moments, definitely David becoming heavyweight champion of the world. From London, England, the new David Hay is the WBA heavyweight champion of the world. What a moment! Britain's seventh world heavyweight title holder. I've never been so happy in the What was that like? It was incredible. It was a bit surreal because I was very, very early on in my career into full-time boxing trainer, boxing strength and conditioning coach. So when it happened, it kind of happened very quickly. And then here he was, he'd achieved his dreams of becoming heavyweight champion of the world. And I was part of that. I do remember that when we were in the ring celebrating, I started splashing water all over the place like a mad person because everyone was so happy. And then I was, I got told off by the British Boxing Board of Control, one of the members saying, there are other fights after this one. So you've just wet the ring and people are going to be slipping all over the place. So please don't do it again. And so I remember that. So that was kind of like a quick introduction into the do's and don'ts. And are there any other stories that really stand out from, from the other many boxers that you've been working with? George Groves, when George Groves beat James the Girl. Peter Marciano was training George, but I was also training George in America when he was coming out there. And him beating James the Girl was definitely like, I remember the euphoria because it was such a big fight. There was, it was a grudge match between the two of them. And working with Amir Khan as well was another highlight. I'm very lucky and very fortunate that the people that I get to work with are people that I want to work with because they have a tremendous work ethic. They don't become a world champion in boxing if you don't work hard. And you, you know, because there can only be one in that division. You have to work extremely hard to become world champion at anything. And I never work with people that I think are going to waste my time or I'm not going to, because you spend so much time with these people, not just the boxers, you know, business people, actors, rappers, performers. You spend a lot of time with these people. So you have to pick carefully, as it were, because otherwise you just end up doing something that you love, but with a person that you don't really get on with. So I've been very fortunate that the people I've worked with have all I uh, think gotten on with. Knowing you as I do, I think good karma is really important to you as well. You, mm, you're you a yeah. real gentle soul. And oh, thank you. that came across that very first day when you were just quietly talking about what you did. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to know more and learn more, but and I love the fact that everything you do for people, it's tiny steps and there's no point bombarding somebody with completely changing their life is there, yeah, no, in no. an instant because it doesn't work like that. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. I think it takes 14 days for something to become a habit. So 14 to 21 days, depending on the person. So if you think it takes, let's say, a month for something to really become ingrained and become something that you do automatically... You can only really change if you're really dedicated about 10 to 12 things a year. So if that's, I'm going to drink more water, that takes a while. If it's, I'm going to chew my food a little bit more before I swallow. That was one of the tips. Uh, Someone asked me, give me some tips to lose weight this year. And the first five tips had nothing to do with exercise. It was just sleep, try to get to bed earlier and wake up earlier. Because there are studies that show that people who go to bed earlier and wake up earlier are thinner than people who don't. <laughs> so, we like that. So that's a simple one. You try to get to bed even if it's an hour before. Chew your food more before you swallow it. I went to a detox place in Austria back in 2004. I didn't eat for three weeks. I'm glad I wasn't with you. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing they did give you was a very, very hard, weak old piece of bread with a probiotic sheep's yogurt, which yes. tasted as good as it sounds. Yeah, you're selling um, this. Sounds like something out of the jungle. Yeah, so we had to chew this tiny little piece of bread a hundred times before swallowing it. It was maybe a quarter of a toast. Halfway through that quarter, I was already full because you have to chew. So you're kind of, when you chew so much, you trick your brain into thinking that you've been eating for ages. <laughs> So you don't eat as much and your stomach, your system starts to shut down. It starts to detoxify. You have more energy. Chew your food more, drink more water, sleep earlier, wake up earlier. And those are just some of the things that you can start to do before you touch exercise. 
And it is a mindset, isn't it? Because, you know, I've been guilty, like lots of people have, of thinking it's January, it's going to be the new me, the new start. And my mental attitude has changed now in that I'm in this now for good. I like feeling really good and the journey that I started with you. But you have to be in the right place. And that's why it's baby steps, isn't it? Absolutely. If you go all in, you are less likely to succeed. Uh, Psychologically, we like to achieve things. And it makes us feel better. So if you set your goal too high, by the time you get there, so much time has elapsed before you get there that not very many people have the willpower to keep going for a year. But if you set small goals like, I'm just going to go to bed earlier or I'm going to drink a little bit more water. If you're logging that, by the end of the month, you go, wow, I slept this many more hours. I'm standing on the scales and I weigh less. I'm drinking more water, so I feel better achievable goals that's the thing and then consistency and most of us are dehydrated aren't we yeah i was um, quite surprised to learn yeah i I read a research paper that said two out of three people in the united kingdom are dehydrated they don't drink enough water and tea and coffee unfortunately doesn't count as water so or wine i guess (laughs) no or wine (laughs) comes as massive disappointment to me yes but again i always say don't go too full into your health journey make sure you still do things that make you feel good. So if having a glass of wine makes you feel good, it's far better for you to say, right, I'm not going to have chocolate, for example, or as much chocolate, and I'm going to have my still, I'm going to have my glass of wine because it makes me feel better. I always have this saying that if I were given a choice between eating burgers all day long and being happy or eating the healthiest organic food, but being unhappy, I'd pick the burgers because that's more important. Being happy is like key to your mental well-being and your physical well-being and your spiritual well-being. So for that reason, picking small goals and ticking them off as you go along is far better for you than saying, right, I want to break the world record for a marathon. You have to break that down. How do you get there? I did the same thing with the athletes that I train. So, right, you want to be world champion, whether it's athletics or football or boxing, you have to break it down. And then as long as you're achieving those goals and they're small, eventually they're becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. But you've gone through that process, so your body's able to do more and more, and you don't really notice it. I do want to talk food in a minute, and also your bit about your childhood, which is also fascinating, and mum, who taught you to cook. But just let's sort of stray, if we can, into that celebrity area, because we all love a bit of a celebrity story. One of my favourite stories from you is when Jeremy Piven came to see you when he was filming here in London and playing Harry Selfridge in Mr Selfridge. He wanted some help training, didn't he? And I think it was because, didn't he have some scenes where he had to, sort of romantic scenes where he was probably going to get his kit off a bit. He wanted to look good, didn't he? Yeah, so I had a phone call from a number I didn't recognise. I answered it, it was Jeremy. And he said, hi, Ruben, it's Jeremy Piven. I got your number from Mickey Rourke. He said if I was in London to come and work with you. So I said, yeah, sure, let's meet up. Because I always like to meet people first before we start working, just to see, like I said before, if we're going to gel. And we hit it off straight away. Jeremy's a lovely guy, really funny. And he had me in stitches the whole, every single training session we worked together. So we were training for... Mr. Selfridge, uh, whilst he was here, he also invited me along to the Entourage film premiere. Um, oh, I loved Entourage. Yeah, it was amazing. So I was a big fan of the, of the series. And so he was a joy to work with. Again, that's one of the things that I count myself lucky that I'm in this position where members of the public may not necessarily know who I am, but in that world, a lot of people know who I am. They come and seek you out. And did you achieve what he wanted? Did he feel more comfortable when he was sort of in those more romantic scenes? Absolutely, he couldn't wait to get his kid off. Really? Excellent. And did it make quite a difference, you know, when he sort of, when he came to you at the beginning and then when he left you, were you pleased with the transformation or the progress that you made? Yeah, absolutely. The only thing we didn't do was take before and after pictures because I've always been one of those people that I don't really take pictures someone said to me the other day oh, i saw that you've been training p diddy have you got any pictures and i said no i trained him for months i never asked for a picture it didn't cross my mind and for today's instagram world that may seem like a very weird thing oh you don't ask for pictures that all the pictures that i normally put on my instagram someone else has taken them and then send them to me. So, yeah, we didn't take before and after pictures, but he looks really good. And P. Diddy, I mean, there's another fantastic name. Please tell me he's cool. Oh, he's, he's an amazing guy. I was training David Hay in a gym in Miami. 
P. Diddy was just working out by himself, but then he finished his workout and he kind of stood in a corner waiting for me to finish my workout with David. And so I said to David, is that P. Diddy? And David said, I think it is. And then David said, why is he just watching? And I said, I've got no idea. It took us about half an hour to finish our, the rest of our session, which he didn't interrupt. And then in the end, he came, he walked over, introduced himself and said, I've never seen some of the exercises you guys were doing. He had no clue who David was. I think he thought Lennox Lewis was still world champion. <laughs> I said, this is the current heavyweight champion of the world. And then he said, oh, okay, makes sense. I've never really seen someone work out like that. You guys have so much energy. Would you mind coming to my house and speaking to myself and my team about what it is that you do? So I think it was the following day, I found some space between training uh, David and I went over to his house. He wasn't there, but there were probably about 30 members of his team, his physio, his masseur, he had a, a nutritionist, a chef, his PA, his girlfriend, Cassie, at the time was there. And they were just all asking me questions. I think I was there for about two hours. They were asking me, what do you do? How do you do it? Etc. And then I left and I thought, okay, I didn't see Puff again. So I thought that was that. And then an hour later, he called me and he said, oh, my team thought you were amazing. I spoke to his doctor as well. And can we start tomorrow? So we started and yeah, it was very, very cool to train. Did you have any funny experiences with him? Um, regarding money, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, he offered me an obscene amount of money to uh, to train him and just be with him. But I had signed a, a contract with David and so I couldn't break that. But he was just a lovely guy. So if I hadn't been working with David, which meant coming back to the UK, I would have probably stayed on with him for a year or so. That's very, very cool. Tiny Temper is still doing a lot of work with you. I know he's a nice chap because, you know, I've met him a few times coming into the gym. Is he good fun to work with? Oh, he's unbelievable. Tiny's a lot of fun. And the conversations that Tiny and I have, because we've been working together for over 10 years now, the conversations are always inspirational. I'm never quite sure who gets more out of our meetings, whether it's Tiny or myself, uh, in terms of the exchange of information that we have about family, health, business, life in general, current affairs, etc., etc. It's just a joy. Every session is different. We mentioned food earlier and your lovely mum. Another part of that story that you shared with me the first time I met you was growing up in Colombia and talking about your incredible mum and how she's inspired you food-wise and taught you to cook. Yes, yeah, so both my parents are South American. One, my mum is white, my dad is black, but my mum has Spanish descendants with South American Indian. And so when it comes to food, both my mum's side of the family cook differently to my dad's side of the family. So growing up, I had African food and South American food. And then when I moved over here, my mum was very much into, my mum was a chef. So she was very much into her food and healing through food. So that's kind of how I grew up. I'll give you a funny story. Don't think I could ever get away with doing to my son. My mum's pre-rugby ritual for me every Saturday morning was she'd give me blended raw calf's liver Ooh. with a red onion, raspberries and honey. And I used to have to drink that bloody goo every Saturday morning before rugby. She's like, don't worry, this will make you strong. And did it? Did it work? <laughs> well, I, I played rugby really well, uh, but I don't think that had to do anything to do with it. Sorry, mum. But yeah, so she was that type of person. She was like, if there's anything wrong with you, you eat for health. That's kind of how we grew up. She was a huge influence in me learning to cook. I think I could make lasagna from scratch at the age of seven. And it just went on from there. So nowadays I can cook almost anything. And you were born in Colombia, weren't you? Yes, I was. I was there until I was almost seven and came here when I was seven years old. And it was interesting because I think I'm right in saying that mum left you there for a while with your sister to, to seek a better life here, didn't she? What happened? Well, my mum and dad weren't seeing eye to eye. And they both have different versions of the stories. To, as they would. <laughs> as they would. But I think the thing was, my dad wasn't really looking after us as a family financially. And times were hard in Colombia at that time. Pablo Escobar was around. So my mum decided, after a conversation with her cousin, that London was the destination. And she left myself and my sister with my dad, who 
had no paternal instincts whatsoever. So he just kind of left us to it. And I was a street kid. I grew up on the street. I had to learn to defend myself from a very early age. Colombia was a very dangerous place. So even going to school was, you know, it was like life and death. And then my mum went back for us three years later and she'd set everything up in England, in London. And she brought us over and she said, this is a new life. Grab every opportunity that we can take with both hands. Studying piano, double bass. The early years of our life here in, in the UK was all classical music. Both my sister and I ended up at the Royal Ballet School. And then we went to Haberdasher Asks, a, a school that was a grammar school at the time. And we played rugby, football, did athletics. And then that's kind of what started my intrigue into athletics. And then I became an athlete. She was an amazing or is an amazing mum and certainly was ambitious for you both. I know your sister's a surgeon now. You've both yeah. done incredibly well, but it always makes me smile to think of you at the Royal Ballet School. You are obviously a very physical person and you're very graceful. So I can see that in you. But how did you find being at the Royal Ballet School? And did you have ambitions as a teenager? boy to make that your career? I don't think I ever wanted to become a ballet dancer. <laughs> Looking back at my experiences in the Royal Ballet School, I can look back at it, at it now and say it was incredibly racist. At the time, I think I was the only black person or mixed race person in my class. And then the only other black person I would see would be my sister when I walked past her in the hallway. So looking back at it, I could, the comments and things that people would say, but because of the way that people grow up in Colombia, you're not really made to feel black. It doesn't really exist or it didn't at the time. And so when someone was trying to be racist, it kind of went over my head, didn't understand it, didn't get it. And that's kind of the philosophy I've always adopted throughout my life. So I'm not sure if I've ever looked at it and thought, oh, that person's being racist. I've just got on with my life. I don't really, this is going to sound like a strange thing to say, especially with the whole Black Lives Matter thing right now. So I've never really had time for racism. I've just been like too busy trying to achieve what I need to achieve and trying to get to where I need to get to, to notice those things. So that's what my experience was as a, as a youngster at the Royal Ballet School. They were also very, very nice people. And it was amazing. But as you can imagine, it was a very elitist institution at the time. So I never really wanted to become a ballet dancer. My sister wanted to be a ballet dancer. And my mum, being a single mum, had to take me. And the ballet teacher said, oh, why doesn't Ruben join in instead of just watching? And so I did. And then six months later, a ballet school scout saw me dancing and thought, oh, he's brilliant. So they took me over to the ballet, the Royal Ballet School. And the, kind of like the rest is history. I wonder if those years help shape you and give you perhaps that discipline and determination and drive that you have because you are driven and mm. you inspire people. Do you think it did? Absolutely. I think that when you come from nothing, I had no shoes in South America because my dad was not looking after us properly. So... I literally had no shoes. And when you come from that, seeing all the opportunities that there are in places like the United Kingdom, and then going on to represent the United Kingdom, uh, Great Britain and England in athletics, I was very, very proud of that. I think that my upbringing and places like the Royal Ballet School and places like Haberdasher Asks, where I went to school, secondary school, where all the teachers wore gowns and there were head boys and prefects and that kind of stuff. That all gave me the groundwork that I needed in order to be successful. And I never really thought of it in any other way other than this is just the way life is. You just have to work hard. If you work hard, you get what you want and what you deserve out of life. In a way, do you think you've carried on that in your role as a father? You've got two beautiful children, a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. And do you think you've tried to give them the opportunities that perhaps growing up in those very early days you didn't have? Absolutely. I think that. The role of a parent is always to try and give your children better opportunities, impart knowledge, basically try and make them more successful than you ever were. That's how I see it anyway. So I do push them though. I'm a very pushy parent. If there's such, such a thing as a tiger dad. Are you a tiger dad? <laughs> as harsh and as much as I push them, I think that uh, their mum pushes them more. But they also have a lot of fun. They have an incredible life. So you have to strike a balance, just like with training and uh, with your food. And, you know, I, I know you like 
a glass of wine. Oh, only the odd one, Ruben, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I do like a glass of wine. I like my coffee as well. And yeah, exactly. I want to find balance in my life, which you're always very good about. I, I mm. would actually be miserable if, if you said to me, we're going to embark on this training course and you can never have a glass of wine or you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, that would never happen. No, I don't think, I think it would. And in fact, we are working on a project to show that women who reach a certain age, obviously not me, she winks, <laughs> i.e. early 50s, can still feel like the 37 year old they feel like inside and can be toned and fit and and youthful and not lose their figure as so many women do to changing yeah. hormones i mean that's a really exciting project and i'm just wondering why you feel so passionately about that project i started this years ago with my mum and my mum was going through the menopause and she didn't feel comfortable in her own body so i started doing some research along with the things that i already knew suggested some of the changes that she may take on in order to help her and they did and then a few years later I got asked to work with a lady called Meg Matthews who was a lovely lady and we started working on her menopause and she's gone on to become uh, I think she's got the number one website for menopause in the United Kingdom so she's gone on to help other women and I thought that was very inspiring and very very nice of her and I've helped a few people along the way, but I thought who better to do it with than someone like yourself who is so dedicated and you're a pleasure to work with. So why not do this? And I think people are going to be surprised how easy it is to make changes and how easy it is to feel better without killing your body through training or through dieting and things that don't really work or are fatty. I don't like fads. Fads come and go, but this is knowledge that has been around for millennia and for one reason or another it gets forgotten it doesn't get listened to and I'm excited. No I think it's brilliant and I think there's such a stigma around it and you know as a broadcaster you don't really want to admit you're that sort of certain age early 50s you know you sort of because you don't feel like that or you hope you don't look quite that old but every woman changes and every woman's body changes and actually you know what there are some amazing things you can do I feel fitter and healthier in many ways now than than I did in my 20s or 30s. So I think it's it's brilliant to try and inspire other people through that. Um, just for people listening who are perhaps three weeks into their sort of January effort yeah. and it's all going horribly wrong, what advice would you give to get people motivated and gradually change lifestyles for the long term? Set small goals. If you're setting small goals and you're achieving them, you're going to feel better than if you're trying to achieve huge goals. Say what you're wanting to do, say it to friends, say it to family, because then you're, they're holding you accountable for it. Don't do it to the point where you're saying, I'm going to break a marathon record. Yeah. So just small things like I want to lose a kilo in a month. Sleep is crucially important. So go to bed early, wake up early, drink more water, chew your food more whilst you're eating it. So if you normally take two or three chews and then swallow your food, think I'm going to chew my food 20, 30 times before I've swallowed it. And avoid fads, do you think, too? Oh, absolutely. And then the other thing is make sure that whatever you're doing, everything is balanced. Nowadays, people want a quick fix for a lot of things. And I think that things like Instagram and Facebook and all of these social media platforms, people see people looking incredible, but they don't really understand how that person's got there. And what I was shocked to find out the other day was I saw a guy took a, take a picture of himself and then he was editing the picture to give himself sharper abs. <laughs> <laughs> and so that kind of thing is important for people to understand that it's just a picture. When you're embarking on a journey, it's crucial. It's like one of the most important things is to have balance. If you want to get in shape, you shouldn't really be doing high intensity training every day because... High intensity training causes free radicals and free radical damage in your body. And if you're doing it every day, your body doesn't get time to recover from it. So you're actually causing premature aging and you're getting older quicker. And now it may not matter to an 18, 19, 20 year old, but it does matter to a 30, 35, 40, 55, 60 year old. So make sure that your training is well balanced with strength work. Um, yes, do high intensity, but do it maybe once or twice a week. Stretching routine, especially the older you get, is really important to keep flexibility 
where in your muscles, your joints, and have fun. Have fun. That's really, really important. If you're not enjoying the training sessions, then you're really doing the wrong training sessions because some of the training sessions I give my athletes and my clients, etc., are hell, but they're still enjoying them. You know, so you have to get creative and inventive. Seek good advice. There's very good advice on the on the internet. Whatever you do, don't do the same thing day in, day out because you burn out. It's not good for you and you won't get the results long term that you, you're looking for. You've given some great tips and advice. Just wanted to end with your thoughts for this year, for 2021 and what you're particularly looking forward to or what you're doing that's going to make this year special. What am I looking forward to in 2021? I think I'm looking forward to the world getting back to some kind of normality to seeing crowds in a football game, to being able to watch my son play football, for example, not being able to watch him play football for almost a year. I'm really looking forward to all of the projects that I've got coming up. I'm very excited. We're doing a collaboration with the Organic Pharmacy, which is four different supplements, one for rejuvenation, detoxification, energy, and a protein supplement. And that comes out around April, May, so I'm really looking forward to that and all the other online projects. We've got products called Booty and the Beast. As you can imagine, it turns your booty and legs and that comes out within a week. I'm really looking forward to all the things that we're doing, writing a book, working with Helen Fospero. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, every, everything's amazing. I think that I really look forward to every day. Every day is different. I've created a world where I'm always busy. I'm enjoying the things that I'm doing and I'm working with people that I absolutely love and make me laugh all the time. And so, yeah, I feel very happy and blessed. That's so important. You always make me laugh when we try and work out what day, what time we're going to do our session. And I'm struggling to find a time when you say to me, there are 24 hours in the day, Helen. (laughs) And I know that you're serious that if I'm leaving home at seven, you'd be happily there at five. So, um, no, your um, positivity and inspiration certainly rubbed off on me. So thank you for sharing some Earl Grey tea and honey with me this You're afternoon welcome. and your story. It's nice actually to sit down and just listen. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You've been listening to performance expert Ruben Tabares. Check out his app, Minboso, which stands for Mind, Body and Soul. It's full of useful tips. I'll be back next week with another inspirational guest. So don't forget to subscribe to our series of podcasts at convex.podbean.com or search the Convex Conversation on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts or just ask Alexa. See you soon. Bye for now.